I'm Bob Hansen. Uh, my training's in internal medicine, critical care, and anesthesiology, and we're going to be talking about pathogenesis of atherosclerosis and uh, clinical implications. I started this discussion at this meeting last year where I talked about the um, lipoprotein model of, of atherosclerosis and uh, more specifically something called the lipoprotein retention model. And I accuse that model of uh, missing some important mechanisms. Um, basically, the model states that ApoB containing particles, and LDL represents about 95% of ApoB circulating in, in your blood right now, that the particle number drives penetration of the endothelium. And that uh, once the endothelium is penetrated, there's mechanisms that creates retention and um, uh, inflammation and subsequent cascade of atherosclerosis. But the missing link here is why do and how do lipoprotein particles penetrate the vascular endothelium? It's just presumed that this is a mass effect and that's uh, not acceptable. Um, once they penetrate, it's, it's well understood that there are changes in smooth muscle cells, there are macrophages and monocytes that convert to macrophages and a whole inflammatory cascade continues. Now, we've been discussing uh, in several of our discussions yesterday and today insulin resistance, but insulin resistance is only one of many factors. If you open up the uh, PDF file that is on Facebook, I put down about 98 different factors that influence cardiovascular disease and atherosclerosis. And here we're talking about the development of plaque. After plaque develops, of course, inflammation and other factors enter into the picture of whether that uh, plaque becomes unstable and, and, and results in a myocardial infarction, uh, non-hemorrhagic stroke, or in, in, in symptomatic uh, peripheral arterial disease. But if we're going to address root causes from a functional me medicine point of view, we need to talk about how does plaque form. So uh, there are many questions. How does insulin resistance and sympathobagel imbalance, uh, sleep disrup disruption and other factors, how do they contribute to pathogenesis? And we know that um, in clinical studies, randomized controlled studies, one good study on meditation, that transcendental meditation, uh, reduces post-MI, that's secondary prevention, risk by approximately 50% for a subsequent cardiovascular event, which is greater than statins or cardiac rehab. Cardiac rehab and statins for secondary prevention decrease cardiovascular risk for, us, for another event by about 33%. And we're going to talk about how does a paleo lifestyle mitigate the factors that contribute to atherosclerosis. So uh, we're going to talk about the uh, re response to retention model. We're going to talk about endothelial penetration and retention. We're going to talk a little bit about LPA, which is underappreciated. A third of the U.S. population has an elevated LPA, and LPA is very important. Uh, we talk about uh, low-carb, high-fat diets as being an ideal diet, and I would contest that a solution for everyone. I think that there's a lot of interaction between uh, single uh, nucleotide polymorphisms, uh, ApoE4 status, all these things need to be considered when you're making dietary recommendations for primary prevention, which is different from dietary recommendations for secondary prevention. If somebody walks into your office that's had an MI and they, they're ApoE4 and they've got some uh, methylation issues, then a high-fat, low-carb diet may not be the best for them, even if they're insulin resistant. I would just throw that out there. This morning we had bacon, sausage, and eggs, besides green leafy vegetables, um, and some fruit out there for breakfast. Now, I would submit that bacon and sausage is not a paleo food. It's certainly low carb, but it's not a paleo food. And eggs probably were consumed in a paleo environment occasionally, but they weren't chicken eggs and they weren't raised on farms, they were free range, and even though you can get free range chicken eggs, most of the eggs that we consume, at least on this trip, are not free range. And the bacon that we're consuming was never a regular food for our Paleolithic ancestors. 
the food preparation techniques for bacon probably produce numerous oxysterols and oxidized uh, fats that are atherosclerotic. So they may be low carb, but they may not be good for a patient who already presents with coronary disease. And they may not be a good idea for a lot of people on a regular basis. So just examining our breakfast this morning. Suggestions are taken for the treat for no. next year. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, I'm, I'm just trying to integrate and to get us to think a little bit deeper about what is paleo, what is not, and uh, what happens in atherosclerosis. So oxidized LDL, glycated LDL, uh, triglyceride-rich uh, particles and remnant particles are all particles that can contribute to the formation of atherosclerosis. In fact, when we look at oxidized LDL, as, as a single number, it's got more predictive value for the presence of atherosclerosis than looking at a multiple risk factor analysis. Functional versus uh, dysfunctional LDL, HDL. HDL can be a great player or it can be a bad player. And patients not only with insulin resistance, but patients with hypercholesterolemia tend to have dysfunctional HDL. Endothelial permeability is, is a big issue that's not been addressed in the lipoprotein retention model. The glycocalyx, which covers the vascular endothelium, is one important factor. Penetration of lipoprotein containing particles through the glycocalyx is one potential mechanism. But then there are the junctions between the endothelial cells that can be penetrated. Interesting fact for secondary prevention is that meditation by itself protects us more than anything else that we can do in terms of drugs, even more than exercise, although I think exercise is important. And I'm going to get to sympathovagal imbalance because there are lots of connections between uh, sympathovagal imbalance and uh, other risk factors. If you open up the PDF file that I sent, I'm going to jump way to the ending and then come back to the talk. Um, <clears throat> last year when I gave this talk, uh, Tommy Woods uh, said, hey, Bob, we need to do a uh, systems approach, a systems analysis, an engineering approach to, to atherosclerosis. And so uh, several months ago, I was sitting down, and my mind was in somewhat of a fugue state. I just put, I created three files. One was factors that affect uh, oxidative stress, factors that cause insulin resistance, and then I started putting and, and factors that affect um, uh, lipid profile. And I put those all together into one big file that had more than 90 factors that affect uh, atherosclerosis. And so you've got all of those on your handout. But one of the factors out of those 98 is insulin resistance. And it's a very important factor, but it's not the only factor. Now this, I don't know why this is so. OK, uh, this is just a demonstration of um, penetration of the endothelium. That's good. OK, this, this is the lipoprotein retention model. And to, to beat a, head, a dead horse to death, it shows uh, lipoprotein particles entering the subendothelial space, becoming oxidized and then uh, inducing the formation of foam cells and the su subsequent plaque formation. It drives me crazy that these models portray it this way when we know that, in fact, circulating oxidized LDL is one of the strongest predictors of, of an atherosclerotic event. But this shows that the LDL becomes oxidized after it penetrates. So th there's something missing in this model. And the part that's missing is why why do lipoprotein particles penetrate the endothelium? And we'll move on from there. Um, this is, uh, again, uh, a famous review, review article on the uh, lipoprotein retention model. Uh, thank you. Um, and again, it's just showing lipoprotein particles penetrating the endothelium. Well, how do they do that? Well, they do that because there's a lot of them. That, that, that's not a complete picture, and that's, that's uh, one of the problems with this model. But is it time to eat my words? Last year, I said there's no evidence that unmodified LDL or unmodified lipoproteins can penetrate the endothelium. 
Well, that's not quite true. And there was data before. Autopsies uh, studies have demonstrated not just oxidized LDL in the subendothelial space in patients that are asymptomatic in young, healthy, otherwise healthy trauma patients who have died from trauma. Um, but there's also native non-oxidized LDL. There's oxidized LDL, which represents about 80% found in, in the autopsy studies on people that did not have symptomatic coronary disease. And we don't know how much of the oxidized LDL was oxidized before it entered the subendothelial space. But this study only measured using one kind of assay for oxidized LDL. And there are many oxidation products on the surface membrane of, of LDL and other lipoprotein particles that were not measured. And oxysterols were not measured. And oxyphytosterols uh, were not measured. But the fact that non-oxidized LDL particles were found in a subendothelial space in young, healthy people on autopsy studies and trauma patients suggests that unmodified lipoprotein particles can and do penetrate the endothelium. So in the blogosphere for um, uh, paleo diet, there's this discussion that, oh, small dense LDL is dangerous, large dense is not, high numbers are meaningless. Um, I, I, think, I think that's wrong, and, and we should not promulgate mythology that small dense is, is, is bad and large buoyant is good. There are a lot of things running around uh, the discussion in the blogosphere and the paleo world that I think are um, not supported by science. We do know that oxidized sterols, glycated uh, lipoproteins uh, are all important and they're pro-inflammatory and they do lead to increased risk, but we don't routinely measure them. And in fact, up until a few years ago, measuring oxidized LDL was only available in three labs in the world, and it was a research um, tool. So in early human atherosclerosis, there are fatty streaks that develop. This was a Japanese autopsy study that showed intimal uh, deposition which initially was independent of foam cell death, okay? So one of the thoughts in the lipoprotein retention model was that uh, particles penetrate, the foam cells come in, and there is uh, an inflammatory response. But lipoprotein particles can be retained without any foam cell involvement at all. Macrophages are not necessary. They, they can be found and retained. The existence of oxidized and enzymatically modified LDL was also uh, demonstrated in the human arterial wall and other studies. And this quote, the relationship between permeability of the arterial wall and susceptibility of atherosclerosis is, is debatable. Uh, I don't understand why they would say that. Um, Penetration and permeability are an important factor that ha have not been elucidated. Okay, oxidized LDL, any modified LDL can, can in increase the inflammatory response leading to the cascade of atherosclerosis. Another paper that talks about uh, deposition of normal and oxidized LDL particles. The uh, local extracellular matrix alterations uh, are independent of inflammatory or apoptotic processes, meaning that retention of lipoprotein particles does not require the immune system, that this can occur because of the endothelial matrix proteins. Okay. Uh, glycation, oxidation are all processes that can occur in the vascular system before penetration, and these are important. It's been de demonstrated in many studies that um, LDL retention is associated with uh, loss of antioxidants. The two major antioxidants in lipoprotein particles are coenzyme Q10 and vitamin E. Even though vitamin E 
supplementation does not, in, in human studies in vivo, prevent atherosclerotic events or decrease risk. We do know that, that um, in animal models, uh, when you supplement with vitamin E and with uh, coenzyme Q10, that in animal models you can decrease atherosclerotic events. And we know that we can prevent the formation of oxidized lipoproteins uh, using antioxidants. Okay, so um, in terms of nutrition and dietary supplements, uh, polyphenols, selenium, uh, beta hydroxymethylglutaryl coenzyme A reductase inhibitors, statins, all show a reduced susceptibility to LDL oxidation. Glycated LDL is more sensitive to oxidation than native LDL. Um, the glycation process reduces LDL receptor recognition of apoproteins. And as a result, they circulate longer and they're more likely to become oxidized. Pomegranate juice, interestingly, decreases LDL susceptibility to um, oxidation in humans and in mice. And in mice, regular pomegranate juice in mice models does reduce atherosclerotic events and reduces on autopsy studies at sacrifice of the animal the amount of atherosclerosis. Let's go on, let's go on. Okay, so once you have plaque formation, we know that, that um, stress and inflammation contribute to uh, creating an unstable plaque, and that can lead to an event. But the primary focus of, of this discussion is on the actual formation of plaque. Uh, there's less debate about what happens after plaque is there. So endothelial uh, permeability, how can a lipoprotein particles penetrate? There can be disruption of the glycocalyx. There can be uh, leaky junctions between the endothelial cells, uh, just like we have leaky uh, junctions in the gut. There can be transcellular mechanisms, such as penocytosis or combinations of all these events. How much each of these contributes remains debatable. This is a, a picture of the glycocalyx, which covers the endothelial cell. It's about five times the width of the endothelial cell itself. Oxidized lipoproteins, we know, uh, degrade the endothelial surface. And there's a hypothesis that uh, arterial glycocalyx dysfunction and interruption is the initiating event, or at least contributes significantly to the formation of plaque. So low blood flow in, in arteries is associated with the uh, shear stress of the glycocalyx. We know that in areas of low shear stress or high shear stress, there can be damage to the glycocalyx. So this occurs at, in areas where the um, arteries branch off. Sites of low shear stress are more susceptible to atheroma, and mechanisms have been identified. Nitric oxide generation is reduced. Exercise increases blood flow. Uh, and shear stress, so exercise is protective. There are many things which will uh, protect. Luminal hyperglycemia causes glycocalyx dysfunction. There we go with insulin resistance and hyperglycemia, but so does hypernatremia. When plasma sodium is slightly above 140, the vascular endothelium stiffens, nitric oxide uh, release declines, and this may be a mechanism that is related to sodium consumption or sodium potassium balance. It's clear that sodium excess damages the glycocalyx in animal models. There are several mechanisms that promote vascular dysfunction and hyperpermeability. Oxidative stress, inflammation, activation of apop 
photonic signaling. So HDL, functional HDL, um, chaperones apopro apolipoprotein M, which protects the glycocalyx. And HDL-associated S1P is responsible for the beneficial effects on vascular integrity. HDL promotes the endothelial barrier. Dysfunctional HDL does the opposite. S1P is responsible for about 60% of the vasodilatory effect of HDL. So there are mechanosensory systems that affect the permeability of the endothelium. And this goes back to the um, branching of arteries and where you have either too low or too high a shear stress. But too low or too high a shear stress will produce uh, endothelial disruption. Then there's junctional integrity, the gaps between the endothelial cells. And the regulation of the endothelial bar barrier in the, in the gaps is related, again, to not just chemical but mechanical stresses. So it's a combined action of chemical and mechanical signaling systems that determine the permeability of the gaps between the endothelial cells. And there's a, a lot of work that's been done on that. LPA. LPA is an independent risk factor. There are athletes, paleoathletes, without insulin resistance, without hypertension, that exercise regularly, that suffer MIs in their 30s and their 40s because they have I high LPA. Insulin resistance not present. You don't need any of those other risk factors. All you need is an elevated LPA. And there are numerous case, case reports of, of patients uh, that have elevated LPA, no other risk factor get, that get a coronary stent after an MI or interrupting an MI. What does LPA do? LPA is a protein that attaches to the apple B and blocks the, the connection between the apple B protein and the LDL receptor. So these LDL particles, LPA particles, circulate, deplete their antioxidants, become oxidized, more likely to penetrate the endothelium. Okay, I'm hardly getting to... Um, You're about halfway with the time. Vasovagal, okay. So this is from Kurt Vonnegut, where it describes a hypothalamic pituitary axis and how stress and uh, ad adrenal hormones um, work and what our stress response is. And we all understand that stress is an important factor in probably not only the development and initiation of plaque, but in creating unstable plaque and causing a cardiovascular event. And why is that? Sympathovagal imbalance is a concept that I just started thinking about last year, and it was actually Carol Loffelman that got me thinking about it. Um, Inflammatory cytokines are at the basis of sympathovagal imbalance and its pathologic, pathologic uh, effects. Dysfunction in the autonomic nervous system predicts cardiovascular risk and sudden death in type 2 diabetes and in, in uh, their relatives. And it occurs in prediabetes just as insulin levels start to increase before we see uh, diabetes, we see that uh, sympathovagal imbalance appears clinically before diabetes. And it is one of the best predictors of, of onset of type 2 diabetes. So there's an argument out there for people that are interested in this that this should be a regular part of our screening process, heart rate variability. There are various tests that will um, give us an indicator of how much sympathovagal imbalance there is. <laughs>
The presence of a peripheral neuropathy is a powerful predictor of mortality, probably because it's related to autonomic dysfunction and is symptomatic of sympathovagal imbalance. So we know that the inflammatory response is controlled by neural circuitry related to the autonomic nervous system. There is an inhibitory arc uh, mediated through the vagus nerve and through the uh, parasympathetic nervous system that can calm down the inflammatory response to many processes, including sepsis, trauma. And the lymphoid organs uh, and the immune system cells are innervated by cholinergic, catecholaminergic, dopaminergic, peptidergic neurons, and neurotransmitters can interact with the immune cells and alter their function. So we know about the organization of the autonomic nervous system, parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. One interesting point made in, in a review article was that stimula stimulation of both simultaneously, both the vagus and the sympathetic nervous system, will result, result in a greater increase in cardiac output because you can increase your ejection fraction when the heart rate slows down with more uh, preload and left atrial filling. So damage to one or another component may not have as much effect on cardiac output as uh, damage to both components of the system. So just a quick review of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, so macrophages have receptors for uh, acetylcholine, and the brain is related through the um, hypothalamic pituitary axis, and it receives messages through the vagus nerve from the gut and sends messages to the immune system through the vagus nerve. Macrophages have a, a feedback system on the brain and on the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Glucocorticoids suppress the inflammatory response of macrophages. So the efferent arc of the inflammatory response is, is, is termed the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. So exaggerated responses to inflammatory uh, molecules are caused by vagotomy. This is a defensive reflex that's mediated through the parasympathetic nervous system. And uh, we rely on this defensive reflex to prevent us from multi-organ system failure and, and infection, trauma, stress. We'll skip that. That's Okay, so we, we talk about the um, advanced glycation end product receptor as being part of this system, damps, damage-associated molecular patterns released from damaged cells can stimulate the immune system. There are ligands re, uh, derived from monocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells called pathogen-associated molecular patterns that activate toll-like receptors, increasing a nasty actors, cytokines, inflammatory mediators. Loss of autonomic control with reduction in parasympathetic activity is the hallmark of autonomic dysfunction and diabetes, and it initiates a cascade of inflammatory response. So autonomic imbalance, autonomic neuropathy, is associated with not only increased sympathetic activity, but decreased parasympathetic activity. And in theory, we can restore balance, not just by directly addressing insulin resistance, but by doing some other things. This, this shows multiple biochemical mediators in the inflammatory response, and it shows acetylcholine receptors inhibiting the inflammatory response. Okay, newly diagnosed type 2 diabetics and pre-diabetics have decreased parasympathetic modulation of the heart and a shift toward augment, 
accepted sympathetic tone. This is an early finding and can be uncovered with simple diagnostic tools such as heart rate variability, and there are software programs that you can use with your smartphones to uh, evaluate that. So a reduced heart rate variability uh, independently predicts a mortality uh, in high-risk patients. It's independent of all other cardiovascular risk factors when you look at heart rate variability and other signs of autonomic dysfunction. We know that accumulation of um, advanced glycation end products correlates with the severity of uh, peripheral and autonomic nerve abnormalities even before diabetes has a clinical manifestation. Well, something happened. Oh, no. It's working. Okay. So, um, Autonomic imbalance may be a key component involved in both the etiology and clinical course of cardiovascular disease. Loss of autonomic balance derives, there, in the ACCORD study, there was a, a catastrophic increase in sudden death in patients with uh, loss of autonomic balance, it should state. So analysis of heart rate var variability independently and simultaneously measures both parasympathetic and sympathetic activity. So that's giving you a, um, a ratio of sympathetic and parasympathetic, but there are other ways to measure those independently, the low frequency component and the high frequency component of heart rate variability. Oh, I think we talked about this a little before. Electrical stimulation of an intact vagus nerve protects against uh, endotoxin-induced shock. So loss of heart rate variability, as well as the loss of sympathetic-parasympathetic balance, can occur before the advent of inflammation. And this is a a conceptual demonstration that we have first to the left in the course of time abnormalities in the sympathetic parasympathetic balance then inflammation occurs and then there's a, a cascade of subsequent events but early on in diabetes before you see inflammation you see changes in sympatho vagal balance We're getting there, I hope. So one interesting statement in, a, in another review article was that the effects on adipose tissue cytokine release may be a consequence of autonomic dysfunction as opposed to the corollary. And Tommy Woods and I have had a debate over this issue. I, I don't think it's uh, resolved yet. So. There are different things, and of course, this comes from a review article I was talking about medical intervention. So of course, they talked about drugs. I put in the red, okay? <laughs> okay? So meditation, yoga, exercise, and walking your dog. And there's an interesting study done in little old ladies who walking did improve their heart rate variability. If they walked their dog, it improved it even more. If you took the dog away from them while they were walking, their heart rate variability decreased. Okay, so exercise is good. Walking with your dog is better. And if someone takes your dog away, you lose some of the benefit. I, I thought that was fascinating. Human study. So what improves 
uh, sympathovagal imbalance. Exercise, meditation, yoga, biofeedback, maybe acupuncture, relaxation techniques, pets, and far infrared sauna. There's tons of data on that, but to get into all the data that supports these interventions would be another talk. But I have found multiple studies that support the use of all these. Acupuncture is still a question mark. I put it there because it, because it might be helpful, but the data is not real strong. But all of these other interventions in patients with or without insulin resistance uh, show that improvements in sympathovagal imbalance. And again, we come back to the study on transcendental meditation. I was disappointed that it wasn't mindfulness-based because I do mindfulness-based, and I don't know how to do transcendental meditation. But almost a 50% reduction in, in secondary prevention following initial MI. All-cause mortality, myocardial infarction, or stroke. Follow-up was 5.4 years. And when you compare this to cardiac rehab, cardiac rehab is about a one-third, you know, 33% reduction. Statin drugs are about a 33% reduction. Oh, this is the walking your dog study, and it shows uh, the difference when, when you take away the dog. So how does a paleo lifestyle pr protect us from the formation of atherosclerotic plaque and subsequently down the line probably uh, protect us from plaque becoming unstable? Well, we reduce intestinal permeability, we reduce the LPS absorption, and we protect the endothelial glycocalyx from the deleterious effects of LPS. We reduce blood sugar, we reduce AGEs, glycosylated lipoproteins, and we protect the glycocalyx, again, through these mechanisms. These mechanisms are beneficial not just because they protect the glycocalyx, but they do that. Uh, reduce consumption of ex excess linoleic acid, which is easily oxidized, contributing to formation of oxidized LDL. Reduce blood pressure by exercise, nutrition, restorative sleep, stress reduction. We reduce uh, circulating inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. We eliminate the consumption of manufactured trans fats, and we reduce sodium consumption. And there's this big debate about, you know, Chris Kress has been talking about sodium. Is sodium uh, a problem? Is it not? I think it, it is a problem in proportion to the amount of potassium and magnesium that we consume. And by eliminating refined carbs, we reduce uh, lipoprotein remnant particles, which do participate uh, in atherosclerosis. We increase the omega-3 index, a favorite topic for Jasmine. We know that within three to six weeks, omega-3 supplementation can stabilize carotid plaque. How do we know that? Some brilliant pathologists in London in the early 1990s did a study where they supplemented with omega-3 versus linoleic acid containing oils for patients that were on the elective schedule for carotid endarterectomy. And the average was between three and six weeks of supplementation when the pathologist looked at the carotid plaque, the carotid plaque for patients that were supplemented, again, for a period that varied between three and six weeks, was more stable and less inflamed, indisputable. And the, the result of that study should have shook the world on the Heart Association's recommendations for increasing omega-6 fats. And it didn't. It amazes me. Um, so paleo diet also improves HDL function by mitigating metabolic syndrome. Of course, we understand how that is associated with dysfunctional HDL. Um, improving the gut microbiome, enhancing production of butyrate. I didn't talk about the protection of butyrate, but I think most people know about that. Decrease intestinal permeability, decrease circulating LPS, decrease probability of autoimmune disease, speculative but we all believe it's true. It exercise enhances sympathovagal balance, improving cholinergic control of inflammation, stress reduction, yoga, meditation, which I consider part of the paleo lifestyle, even though our ancestors didn't meditate. Uh, it enhances sympathovagal balance, improves cholinergic control of inflammation. Food preparation techniques. 
let's talk about bacon again and barbecue. We had barbecue last night, uh, and I'm not being critical, but I, I want to talk about how we look at our lifestyle. Is it paleo, is it not? I don't think barbecue is paleo uh, because we create with high heat and high dry heat oxidative st oxidized sterols, and we create uh, oxidized fatty acids that contribute to atherosclerosis. We already know that oxidized LDL is a bad actor. Glycated LDL is bad. We reduce our blood sugar, we reduce glycation and advanced glycation end products. But if we cook with high dry heat, we're going to create oxysterols and we're going to create oxidative stress. So food preparation te techniques, okay, we don't need this slide anymore. Um, I did not talk about hypercytosterolemia, but uh, to drive home the point that insulin resistance is important, but it's not everything, I want to bring up three natural experiments that have occurred. One I already mentioned is that patients with isolated, elevated LPA have early cardiovascular events. They are not insulin resistant, they are not diabetic, they are lean and mean, and they're often triathletes. But despite all of that and eating a paleo diet, they can have MIs in their 30s and their 40s. That's documented. So clearly there's something more than insulin resistance going on in some, possibly many patients. Okay. Where were my notes? Okay. Hypercytosterolemia is a rare condition in which plant sterols are absorbed to a very large degree. Now, in the intestine, of course, plant sterols are absorbed into the uh, intestinal wall cells, but then they are spit out. Biochemically, we get rid of them. But there is a... Um, single nucleotide polymorphism that results in uh, some people not being able to rid the uh, intestinal lining of the plant sterols. These patients are very high absorbers of primarily beta-cytosterol. Now, beta-cytosterol, uh, humans lack the enzymes necessary to, um, I can't think of the word now, esterify beta-cytosterol and other plant sterols. So as a result, they're carried on the outer membrane of lipoprotein particles. 95% of the cholesterol carried by lipoprotein particles is est esterified and it's inside the particle. About 5% is on the outer wall. So it's the, the sterols, both cholesterol and non-cholesterol sterols, on the outer wall that are subject to oxidation and modification. So <clears throat> Patients with familial hypercytosterolemia have tendons anthomas, they have deposition of, of non-cholesterol sterols throughout their body, and they have oftentimes sudden death at an early age from cardiovascular events, and they have increased risk of stroke at, a, at an early age. They don't have insulin resistance, okay? They're not obese, and they may not be hypertensive, but if you have hyperbetacytosterolemia, you have a high probability of dying from a cardiovascular event at an early age and a high probability of, of suffering stroke. So sterols are important, okay? And there is a supplement that is a combination of plant sterols and stanols that will reduce your cholesterol absorption, and a lot of people think those are great. But there are not just patients with familial hypercytosterolemia that, for those patients, it would be a disaster to use that supplement. There are hyperabsorbers of sterols that are not quite at that extreme. That if you give them the a plant sterols, you will be worsening their situation. Because it may reduce their cholesterol absorption, but you'll be increasing their absorption of a sterol, which cannot be esterified. So 100% of that sterol is carried on the outer surface of, of the uh, LDL or other apoprotein B-containing particles and will be subject to oxidation. 
and other forms of modification. So we have examples. The third example uh, of <coughs> insulin resistance is not necessary to, to cause uh, atherosclerosis or atherosclerotic events are in patients with SNPs related to the degradation of the LDL receptor. There's a new um, <laughs> antibody that's on the market that's very expensive for patients that fail to respond to statins or fail to tolerate statins. That's been FDA approved before even good clinical controlled trials. They address um, that mechanism for decreasing circulating LDL particle number by uh, the antibody attaching to the protein or enzyme that degrades the LDL receptor. So what does that do? It increases the number of LDL receptors. It decreases the circulating time of LDL particles and other <laughs> lipoproteins and exposes you to less oxidation, glycation, and modification, which initiate an inflammatory response, initiate adhesion molecules, initiate conversion of monocytes to macrophages, initiate creation of foam cells, and probably initiates uh, endothelial permeability, penetration, and retention. Okay, so I'm getting... So um, if you look at all of the factors on, on the PDF that was uh, put on Facebook kindly by Jeff, you'll see uh, my mind working in a fugue state one night uh, before I sent that, that file to Tom Wood. And you'll see how complex the many factors are that, that interact Hypercholesterolemia, I don't like to use that term. I would I prefer to say uh, elevated LDL particle number, uh, decreased LDL receptor activity, um, all the things that are related to lipoproteins, glycation, oxidation. Um, those are important, but we have other things. You know, the paleo lifestyle discusses regular exercise, outdoors, sunlight exposure, social interactions, social support, adequate sleep. Those are all part of the paleo lifestyle and arguably more important than nutrition, maybe. We don't know because we don't have randomized controlled trials comparing all those interventions to just dietary changes. My final uh, recommendation is for you to go to Denise Minger's website and read her blog from a couple months ago where she talked about low-fat diet in treating diabetes, insulin resistance, and atherosclerosis, mostly the work of Dr. Esselstein, okay? Now, Esselstein, like Dean Ornish, didn't just use diet. He used meditation, yoga, exercise, smoke cessation, group therapy, okay? So all those things are important. But using all of those things like Dean Ornish did in his study, along with a very low-fat diet, meaning less than 10%, whole foods, low-fat, which means grains and beans, I'm sorry to say, okay, but not white bread, and no studies he demonstrated incredible results with diabetics, with insulin resistance, with atherosclerosis, and even plaque regression, even though you're skeptical that that can happen, okay? How can that be? How can a physician take a group of patients with insulin resistance or diabetes or bad atherosclerosis or combinations of all of those and show significant improvement within several months by going low fat, high carb, okay? You want to read about it? Go to Denise Minger's website. She's got so many citations. It blew my mind when I read that. So there's a lot more going on than just eat more meat, don't eat refined carbs. There's a lot of things going on. And how you approach a healthy diet in someone who's, you know, 20, 30 years old and has no risk factors, doesn't have any methylation defects, is not APOE4, et cetera, et cetera. You know, paleo diet is probably just as good as, as low fat, but once you have atherosclerosis, once you've had a heart attack, once you've had a stroke, there's no study that shows paleo prevents future events. And that's a challenge to us as a paleo community because Dr. Esselstein and people like him have shown that low fat 
does reduce subsequent cardiovascular events. It does improve insulin resistance profoundly and improves diabetes control. And so that's a challenge to us intellectually. How, how can that be? Does it violate our religious belief in, in a paleo diet? You know, I, I think we have to be open-minded about that. So what do you tell those patients? How do you counsel those patients? Uh, I, I don't take care of those patients. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm an anesthesiologist, and, and, and I'm a dinosaur, because not only do I practice anesthesia in the OR, but I spend half my time in a pain clinic, and very rarely do people do both anymore. Okay. I'm like a GP in anesthesia. I do everything. But um, when, when I see patients to manage them with chronic pain, most of them are obese. Many of them are insulin resistant. I recommend low carb. I recommend the paleo diet. But if they're not open to that, or if they're frightened by that, I, I tell them that the alternative is something which is not very palatable, but it's very low fat. And when I start explaining, how low fat that is and what that they can't have olive oil, they can't eat nuts, they can't eat avocados, they can't eat any meat. Uh, Esselstein allows six ounces per week of meat or fish. Um, so, and that's how they avoid probably B12 deficiency and, and he does supplement them. But, um, which we know would be necessary. Supplementing with fat soluble vitamins is necessary if, if you're on a low fat diet. But, but his results are incredible. And the paleo community has not come forward with equivalent results, I'm sorry to say. And, and if I had a heart attack today, I don't know what I would do in terms of my diet because I'm APO E3-4. And I have not the bad familial hypercholesterolemia, but my LDL receptors do not work well. And my youngest brother dropped dead at age 27. So I don't know personally what I would do. Would I go low fat? Or would I stay low carb? Avoiding all the oxidative stress and, and all those other issues. I, do, I did start taking berberine <laughs> a few months ago because I read that it enhances LDR receptor activity using the same mechanism that this new antibody yeah, does. No, no, I wanted to use that as an example of people that, know, that, that you know, how do we, had, you know, it's almost impossible to be paleo, truly paleo, by my definition. Do I eat bacon once in a while, but I've been thinking more about it, and I'll probably, uh, I've tried to avoid it at home, but my wife loves bacon. So, so. there's, a, there's a interesting evidence that if you eat bacon from, the bacon from pasture-raised pigs and pork in general has a much better, you know, the main problem with pork is Omega-3 right. ratio, which is terrible, but pasture-raised pork does have a much better balance. Profile. And, for, and my community, I, I have easy access yeah. to that stuff. In your backyard? I source, I source from the ranch. I source from a guy who raises his own pigs. I get chicken eggs and chicken, all, you know, but not, not everybody has access to that. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, sorry, I'm going to cut you guys off, but guess what? We have lots of time during lunch to crack, <coughs> to crack him open. So thank you, Bob. Thank you.